Good morning, everybody. Let's take our word this morning and let's turn or, or tap to uh, Romans chapter 12 and also Philippians chapter 1. All right, Romans chapter 1 and also Philippians chapter 1 this morning. I want you to tell your neighbor right now, I need to rewire my brain and renew my mind. I don't know about your week, but man, there were several moments this week that I was like, man, I need a little rewiring done right now. I need a little renewing right now. And as we look at uh, some different passages today, we can obviously see how uh, Paul was just uh, amazing in these steps. And I want us to see a couple of things uh, about just life in general. Life is never uh, really standing still. It's always moving forward or you're moving backwards. But you cannot stay where you are. Tell your neighbor, you cannot stay where you are. You're either moving forward or you're going backwards, one of the two. And I remember, uh, for me, uh, the first time that I uh, was introduced to a manual transmission, right? Uh, how many of you cannot drive? Maybe you've attempted, maybe you've not, but you cannot drive a manual transmission. Raise it loud and proud this morning. You cannot, right? All right, keep them up, keep them up. You cannot drive a manual transmission. I'm just seeing who we need to have class for. All right, how many of you would say, I've tried it, I can do it, but I'm not very good at it? Let me see you. All right, so you can do it, but it's not the prettiest thing, right? Well, life is either moving forward or backwards. There is no neutral. For me, I was introduced to the manual transmission actually on a dirt bike, uh, it was my uh, best friend, Jason, his dad, Doug. They all rode dirt bikes, and I thought it was the coolest thing, but I'd never been on one. And uh, Doug, hit my friend's dad, said, hey, Matt, you want to ride the dirt bike? I was like, what did I say, guys? Sure. Yeah, sure. So I jump on there, and he says, have you ever driven a motorcycle or a manual? And I was like, I uh, can't remember. And he said, well, here's the clutch on the left. Uh, down for first gear, neutrals in the middle, and the rest are all up, throttles on the right hand. I was like, I got this. He was like, you ready? I was like, yeah, I'm ready. And then I did a wheelie for about 30 yards. <laughs> and I finally remembered, pull the clutch, right, and that disengages, and I came back down, but my adrenaline was going so much, I went ahead and kept going, you know, I figured it out. Um, but man, manual transmission, I remember uh, with a, a friend of mine, uh, the dirt bike, but then also a work truck. Anybody ever drive a, a stick on the manual, a manual on the, on the, the stick up top in the column? Uh, we had a work truck, and then my first car was a five-speed, but actually, you eventually can get good at it, right? But one thing I want you to hear this morning in our story and our thought is your life is moving forward in the direction of your what, church? Your focus. Talked about that last week. Your life is moving forward in the direction of your focus. There is no neutral. Tell your neighbor, there is no neutral. There is no neutral. And I want you to grab that this morning, and I want us to see that this week as we focus on the truth uh, of, of God's Word, that we must remember that we need to rewire our brain, renew our minds, and then we're going to talk a little bit today about rewriting our perspective. I want us to see this morning that Paul is one of the ones that we can best relate with when it comes to these three thoughts. Uh, he had different plans for his life. Have you been there? He had different plans for his life than what he was actually experiencing. And we could say he is the, I could say in the New Testament, he's the goat, right? The greatest of all time of, of rewiring and rewriting and renewing his mind. I want us to realize this morning that Paul had a detailed plan. Anybody ever have a detailed plan? Right? He had a detailed plan to advance the gospel, a very good, awesome thing for the world. He was going to go where, church? He was going to go to Rome. So everybody, he's going to Rome. He's going to Rome. He is thinking that, man, if I can preach the gospel of Jesus to the leaders there, this place could be an amazing, amazing launch pad for the gospel because of all of the avenues, ins and outs of this place. It was a great plan, but it turns out that what? He was locked up in prison, basically under house arrest, chained to a rotating group of guards, and he was awaiting a possible execution. Paul prayed for an opportunity. You've been there? Say amen. 
Paul prayed for an opportunity, but that was not happening. Paul's circumstances were out of his control. This is how we kind of look, trying to control what we can't. Does that look like fun? Everybody say that looks like fun. You know, that's probably what it feels like in life, right? Things are out of control, like I I can't control this. And the thought behind that we're trying to control it, but we can't. Circumstances are almost always out of our control. Yes, we live, we're striving to live in obedience, right? Total obedience is total joy. Uh, Joy moves when God moves. All those things we talked about, we, we, we are working our hardest in obedience, but sometimes we make mistakes which gives us bad or wrong, a bad or wrong decision gives us those wrong circumstances. But sometimes, a lot of times, circumstances are always, always out of our control and there was nothing that we really did, right? Nothing we really did to make that happen. So you've been where Paul was, right? You thought that if, I get, uh, if I'm going to get this job, all I need to do is get this degree. You got the degree, and what happened? You didn't get the job, right? You got this plan. You plan to be married by now, but you just haven't found Mr. Right or Mrs. Right. Maybe you found the right person, but then everything went wrong. That's not the way life was supposed to go, right? Paul was in the same situation. Circumstances he did not want and could not control. So let's get into the story. Say it with me. Let's get into the story. Say it with me. Let's get into the story. I want you to be Paul this morning. I want you to try to get there in your head. I want to try to get there in your heart. I want you to feel. I want you to see what Paul is facing, what, what's happening in his life. Paul was writing to the church of Philippi as we go to Philippians chapter 1. He's writing the church... What has happened to him, and he's sharing this, what could have he, what could have he said instead of what he said? What, what could he have said? I want us to focus on what he, what he did say, but in a minute, right now, I want to just think about what he could have said in this situation, if you remember the story. He could have written something like this. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has been very stressful and stinks big time. I wanted to spread the good news through preaching to the government officials, but that did not happen. As a result of all this junk I've been through, I've decided prayer doesn't work and I'm never going back to church again. Paul could have wrote that. Everybody say he could have. He could have wrote that, but he did not. Remember, Paul could not control what was happening to him, but he can and he did control what was happening what would help him, or what would hinder him. So I want us to look at it this morning, Philippians chapter 12, verses 12 through 14. Look at it with me. Get into the story. Philippians chapter 1, verse 12. But I would, or I would hope so, that you should understand. I'm, I hope and I, I, would, I would long for you to understand but I would ye should understand, brethren. He's talking to the church. He says that the things which have happened, everybody say the things which have happened. They're not good things, but the things which have happened are out of my control. What have happened unto me, having fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. It wasn't how I thought it was going to go, but it's actually been in the furtherance of the gospel. The gospel is going further than what I thought, and it's in a circumstance I don't understand. So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in, what's the next three words? All the palace. And in what? All other places. I want you to notice that the gospel is going much further than Paul ever thought it would. He's amazed that the the circumstances that are out of his control when he's in this place of imprisonment, but he's seeing the gospel move forward. Look at 14. And many of the brethren in the Lord, brethren and sisters, we could say, having, or excuse me, waxing confident, or the power to persuade, or having confidence. That's where God wants us to be. In the renewing of our mind, He wants us to experience this confidence, waxing confident, power and persuasion. It says, in my bonds, because of my imprisonment, they are confident. 
and are much more bold. They're taking risks for the gospel. They're, they're daring to do what needs to be done. They're being bold. Ever say, be bold. They're more bold to speak the word, what's the last two words, without fear. I want us to, to notice this morning what is happening. We could look at these verses and we could say, this is what he was writing in our words. He's writing, I, I had a plan, but God had a better plan. He's writing this, the whole, it's a whole different way of advancing the gospel than I was thinking. God has blessed me with, in, with imprisonment, and I have a guard chained to me. I mean, they have no choice to listen to me as I tell them about Jesus. And these soldiers, they have the ear of influential leaders. And even get this, every eight hours they give me a new guard, and they think I'm in prison. God is moving. Say that with me. God is moving. God is moving, and I can't wait to see what God does next. That's really what Paul is saying. I want you to look at verse 20 also. Jump down to 20. According to my earnest expectation and my hope, this is not going the way that I hoped, but now it has taken a turn that I can't even believe how good it is going, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified. Say the word magnified. Didn't we sing about this, that this morning? Glorified. That God be magnified, be glorified. Hey, Paul, is, that's his heartbeat, that God be magnified in my life. That God be glorified in my life. It says, in my body, in this physical body, whether it be by life, listen, by life or by what? Death. It doesn't matter if I live or I die because of this imprisonment. I want my life to magnify the Lord in my body. I want you to maybe make a side note this morning of how do you want God to be magnified in your life? Maybe that would be just one thing you could write. I want God to be magnified no matter if I'm in prison or I'm not in prison, no matter if I'm uh, enjoying the circumstances or I'm not enjoying the circumstance. It's whether by life or by death, I want him to be pleased. I want him to be magnified and glorified. Now look also at verse 27. Look at this. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Can I encourage you this morning, when you talk to people that don't know the name of Jesus, that you just have a conversation? You don't have to sell Jesus. You realize that? Say amen. You don't have to give a great sales pitch for someone to understand that Jesus is the Savior of the world. You just need to have a conversation with them. And here we see these words, that only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Share the gospel. This is what I'm doing, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs or I may hear of your circumstances. When I hear about the things that are going on, the circumstances of your life, this is what I want to hear, that you stand fast. Can you say stand fast? We're going to talk about that just for a little bit, but stand fast. What does that actually mean? If I'm supposed to magnify God, then I'm going to stand fast. What, what does that actually mean? To stand fast in one spirit and with one, look at the next word, one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. I want you to notice also in verse 20, it says, For unto you that is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Life is not always going to give us the circumstances we want. Having the same conflict which ye saw in me and now here to be in me, verse 30 of chapter 1, to stand fast. I want you to maybe make a side note in your Bible what this means. Stand fast is having perseverance. It's not wanting perseverance, but it's having perseverance in all circumstance. Doesn't matter what it is. Doesn't matter if you're chained to someone. Doesn't matter if things didn't go as you had planned in great detail for what God was going to do and what you thought of how it was going to work out. Seeing having perse perseverance and being persistent. Those two things, stand fast means having perseverance and being persistent. How do we do that? We can do that by standing fast, but in one spirit, in one mind, striving together. Can you say those last two words, striving together? Say it with me, striving together. What are we striving together for? To magnify the Lord 
and to bring the gospel to the world. Can you say amen? You cannot control what happens to you, but you can control how it will help you or it will hinder you. I'm trying to get my notes to work. I don't think it's working for me. If you guys would go to the next slide. So renewing your mind. Renewing your mind. Romans chapter 12, if you'll turn there with me. Romans chapter 12. trying to remember this week when these verses hit me the hardest and I believe it was during the high school senior going into college and these two verses were challenged to me to memorize and so I I tried to embed them in my head and man these verses got some uh, different uh, twists and turns and sometimes it's hard to really get it in your head but man if you'll just stick with it it'll get in there But I remember reading these verses and someone challenging me with this passage, Romans 12, 1 and 2, again, back to Paul being the goat at rewiring and renewing. And then we're going to talk about rewriting the perspective. And here in verse 1, notice the very first couple words, and many of you are very familiar with this. He says, I beseech you. He is begging the church. He is begging them. He's pleading with them. Notice the next word, I beseech you therefore. Whenever, and you probably have heard this, but anytime you see the word therefore in Scripture, you've got to see what it's there for, right? Can you say amen? You've got to see what it's there for. So if you skip back to chapter 11, look at verse 33. It says, why am I begging you to do this? Why am I I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice? Why am I going to tell you to be a living sacrifice? Go back to verse 33. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of wisdom and knowledge of who? How unsearchable are, the, are, the, are his judgments and his ways past finding out. He's so unsearchable. For who hath known the mind of the Lord and who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him and it shall be recompensed unto him again? Who has ever given to God and God has not taking care of them? Who has God not um, noticed? Who is, how, who, what is unsearchable for God? There is no thing, anything that is unsearchable God. Look at verse 36. For of him and through him and to him are all things. Look at those powerful words. To whom be glory forever. Again, the same message of glorifying and magnifying God we see again here in, in uh, Paul's words. He said, this is why I want you to present your bodies a living sacrifice. Is because your God is unsearchable. Your God is unsearchable. He is there for you. He is everything for you. Who has been his counselor and who has known the mind of God? But everything is of him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Notice what it says. By the mercies of God. Because of God's grace, his mercies specifically mentioning the word mercies of God. We're going to look at this next phrase that you present. To place beside or to place near. Are you placing your life as a living sacrifice? Look, Notice what it says. How is this even possible? He says by being holy and acceptable unto God. We could say holy and acceptable is well-pleasing. Everybody say well-pleasing. If I ask myself this morning, God, where is, where is my heart being well-pleasing? And let's celebrate that. But on the turn side of that, let's ask God, God, where is my life not well-pleasing? And may God, you change that. God, would you help me change what is not well-pleasing to you, what is not holy to you, what is not uh, acceptable to you? Holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. The reasonable service means agreeable to reason. After all of who God is, listen to me, After all of who God is, he's unsearchable. If that's who he is, this is the least I can do. Everybody say, this is the least I can do. This is agreeable. This is is something that is not over the top. This is agreeable to reason. 
that I should be this living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. Then look at two, and be not conformed. And when you really study this word out, conformed means to be conformed to a mind pattern. The mind pattern of the world. Are you following me? It says, and be not conformed to this world. Don't follow the thinking pattern of the world. Have you been there before? Have you been influenced by that before? Has it got a hold of your life before? Has it drug you down before? And you have no hope, you have no joy, you have nothing there because the world has changed your thinking pattern? It says, be not conformed to this world. But look, it says to be transformed it means to change form. Everybody say change form. That's what it means to be transformed. Is you actually change the form of who you are. Be transformed by the what? What's the next word? Renewing. You could say the word renovating. Total change. This isn't a touch-up. Everybody say it's not a touch-up. We're not touching up the project. We're renovating the project. He says, that's what I want you to do to the inside of me. I don't want to be conformed to the pattern of this world, but I want to be transformed. I want to change form by the renewing of my mind, the renovating of my mind, that she may prove that I might examine what is that good. Next to the word good, I want you to write the word useful. If you study that word out, it gives us a great impact of the word useful, that, the, that I would prove or I would examine to be proven by renovating my mind that I may show what is useful or what is good, what is acceptable, meaning, meaning the fully agreeable. It's acceptable, it's fully agreeable and perfect, it's complete. The will of God, the wishes of God. What are the wishes of God for you this week? Where in your life would you say, Lord, I have this plan, but God, you have, you have allowed these things to happen, they're out of my control, and so God, I'm going to just keep seeking you and keep trusting you. And God, what is it that you want me to do? Because I want to prove, I want my life to be examined and be useful. I want to be fully agreeable with you, God, and I want to be complete in you, God. If that's you, say amen. God, that's who I want to be. And so in order to be that way, we have to renew our mind. Let's talk about it. So to renew your mind, number one, renewing your mind gets you out of your own head. Renewing your mind gets you out of your own head. Have you ever been in a sports situation where the pressure's on? Right? They're counting on you for the free throw. They're counting on you for that extra yard for the first down. You know what I'm talking about? Everybody say, I, I got some stress. You know, you got it all in your head. Right? It's all in your head. And it's just pounding. It's just pounding. It's just pounding. And renewing your mind gets you out of your head. If you look at verse 1, it even references this in different words, of course. But I want you to realize to get out of scrolling. We scroll way too much. Everybody say, I scroll too much. You know, I found in the last couple of weeks when I'm scrolling for whatever reason, I'm like, what is this? Why is, why is it? This isn't helping my mind. This is rewiring my mind the wrong way. This is not renewing my mind. It's, it's not what I need. And yes, there's times you need to scroll for things, but I don't just need to sit there and scroll. Are you with me? It pulls us down. Renewing our mind gets us out of our own head. Get out of scrolling, reading only news articles, social posts, and headlines that are still that you still have to think about, right? And you have to ask yourself this question when you do those things. Do I agree with what's being said? That's where your brain's at. Do I agree with what's being said? But on the flip side of that, if I go to the reading and listening of Scripture and, and singing and listening to the worship, will align my mind and thoughts to the truth. Can you say amen? What is my listening diet like? What am I allowing to impact my mind? Am I rewiring my brain? Am I renewing my mind? You see, think about it this way. When we allow Scripture to be read and listened to, singing to be uh, sung and to be listened to and worship to align our, our thoughts with the truth, it's not an opinion, it's just the truth. We don't have to think about whether or not we agree with what's being said. It is the truth, so we are to change, to be transformed to what is being said, rather than having an opinion about whether something is true or not. 
I instead can just say, God, I need your help to align my thoughts with the truth I'm reading right now. So number one, renewing your mind gets you out of your own head. Number two, renewing your mind will allow you to rely on God's understanding. Renewing your mind will allow you to rely on God's understanding. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3 real quick. All of us know verse 5 and 6 really well. But I noticed that I had forgotten how that 7 is tagged on. And obviously the whole chapter is, is amazing. But those three verses stick together. You know the verses. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. And he shall direct thy paths. And then look at this. Be not wise in your own eyes, or be not wise in your own head. Be not wise in your own mind. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Reverence Him. See Him as the unsearchable God. And then what's the last part? Depart from evil. God, whatever would be categorized as evil in my life, God, help me to recognize it. Help me to see how I'm being conformed in some way to the world's thinking pattern of whatever topic or subject it is. But renewing my mind will allow me to rely on God's understanding and not my own understanding. When we don't renew our minds, we naturally lean on our own understanding because that's all there is for us. Number three, renewing your mind gives you direction and purpose. Do you like direction and purpose? Come on, talk to me. Do you like direction and purpose? We all do. We all want to have the satisfaction of getting something accomplished, and we want direction and purpose. God says renewing your mind will give you direction and purpose. Obviously, thinking about Paul today and how that he was rewired and he was renewed, obviously because we could see what he declared. We could see what he wrote. And I want, to see, I want us to see this morning that renewing your mind gives you direction and purpose, and we can see this in the Old Testament in Jeremiah chapter 29. You don't have to turn there, but we know the verses 11, 12, 13. God knew his own thoughts. Say that with me. God knew his own thoughts. Say it one more time. God knew his own thoughts. God knew his thoughts for his people, but his people had forgotten what he had said. They needed reminded, and some of them maybe even didn't know. So Jeremiah was used by God to state them and declare them by writing them in his letter in Jeremiah chapter 29. And this is what he said, if you're looking at it, verse 11. Many of us can quote this verse. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall you call upon me. Notice these words. Then shall you call upon me. You shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. And then it says, and you shall seek me and find me. What's the next word? When. The next word is when. You will seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. So I'm asking us this morning, how am I searching for him with all my heart? Or is there other things I'm searching for? Does God have all of my heart or just 80% or just 70%? Am I consciously going to say, okay, God, I I can see. I can see that. I'm kind of focusing way too much over here. And I need to renew my mind to get your direction and your purpose so I will seek you and I will find you when I will search for you with all of my heart. To renew our mind means to, to do away with unhealthy thought patterns and to replace the truth that is needed and ask for his help. Number four, renewing, our, renewing your mind changes you. You could say renewing your mind transforms you. It changes you. If you've experienced that change, say amen. Man, not only for salvation does it change you. When you hear the truth of Jesus died for your sins, you need to receive him as your Savior, meaning you need to ask him for that forgiveness. It changes you. Not only does it change you then, but it changes you in your next step. Every one of us has a next step. Your pastor today has a next step. 
You today have a next step. Will I find that step? Will I search for it? Will I find it? And will I take that next step? So renewing your mind changes you. Here's a thought I want you to write down. It's not a fill-in, but a side note. Keep renewing your mind with God's truth, and it will become true of you. Keep renewing your mind with God's truth, and it will become true of you. So many times there's things that I recognize, I'm like, man, I'm, I'm failing here and I'm failing there. And I, I have taken a portion of my heart back from God and, man, God is specifically telling me I need to change this. And when I recognize it and I start claiming that truth and renewing my mind in that truth, that truth will transform me, change me, and allow, me, allow it to become true of me. Just like Romans 12, 1 and 2, that it may prove that it will examine me and show me that I can actually do this. So you cannot control what happens to you. But church, you can't control how it what helps you or how it will hinder you. We have the choice. So we cannot control what happens, but we can't control how it help us, helps us or hinders us. As we move to the end of the worship guide today, just like Paul did, just like Paul did, he declared truths. We read them. There's even more that we didn't even touch. Paul declares these truths, so the first thing we need to do is write your declaration. Number one at the bottom, write your declaration. Rewrite your perspective, and then write your declaration. Let's stop acting like I'm going to get to it later, and let's write the declaration. At least write the topic that the Spirit of God right now is saying, hey, that's the category. That's the topic. There's something that I'm seeing that is, you might call it very unholy. Someone might call it slightly unholy, but you know it's unholy. And God says, hey, I want you to deal with that. You're like, okay, I'll deal with that. Let's make a declaration about that topic. A couple things about this right here. What do I have in my hand? A pen. You know, I don't use these very often because of this iPad and computer. But you know there's power when this pen hits this right hand and I start putting something on paper. A couple things I wanted to remind myself and you about this morning about writing a declaration. I want you to actually write it with a pen or a pencil in your hand. It's been said that writing is thinking on paper. Writing is thinking on paper. It's been said the hand is the window to the mind. The hand is the window to the mind. It's been said, to grip is to grasp. To grip is to grasp. So will I take the next step? Will I write what God's saying to me? I'm making a declaration about this topic in my heart that maybe no soul knows about except for me and God. It might be something that someone else doesn't know about and maybe you want to share and write that declaration together. But when you put it in your hand to grip is to grasp, what am I declaring to be true in my battle? Ask yourself the question this morning, please. What am I asking God to be true about the battle I'm in? The goal of declaring is to have it become a new pathway, a new thought pathway, an intentional, you can say an intentional trench you're digging of truth in your life. Say, so God, I keep shifting to this and I keep moving to that and my mind is not where it needs to be and I need you to rewire me, I need you to renew me. God, I've got a terrible spirit, I've got a, a heart that's broken, but God, in the midst of my brokenness, just like Paul, I'm going to choose to rewrite or to write a declaration. Because I want to rewrite my perspective of what's happening. We know what Paul could have wrote, but we know what he actually wrote. So I'm asking us today not to think about it, but to take action. Remember, the thought leads to an action, and the action leads to an experience. 
Say it with me. A thought leads to an action, and an action leads to an experience. So how will I face the experience? It depends on where my thought is. It depends on where my actions are. So today, write a declaration of God's truth and make it your own. Write a declaration in a way that inspires you just like the writings of Paul. You actually might write just a verse. You might write verse 1 or you might write verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Maybe that's your declaration and you're going to pound it in your head until it starts changing the way you think and so it becomes true of you. Can I encourage you to put them in the notes on your phone after you write them, right? Record them in a voice memo. Listen to them while you walk. Listen to them while you exercise. Listen to them while you drive. It's actually your own declaration, just like Paul's declaration, but it's more specific to you. And that's who your God is. He is detailed about you. So this repetition will make the difference. When you write your declaration as if it's already true, even if you don't believe it yet, you will. Write the declaration and let God transform you. It seems at times we'll be saying something in a declaration that that we want to believe. And maybe we've not fully believed it yet. But through writing that declaration, God can rewire your brain. He can renew your mind. And ultimately, He can rewrite your perspective. So today, as we finish, not only do you need to write your declaration, you need to repeat your declaration. This isn't a one-time fix-it. The scripture isn't a one-time memory and then, and then uh, it's fixed, you know? It's a constant battle. The topic might change. The scenario might change. We know the circumstances are going to change. But will I repeat the declaration? When you find another topic, listen to me, when you find another topic that the Spirit of God triggers your mind about and you know that you need to work on, write another declaration whether it has to do with money, whether it has to do with an enemy, whether it has to do with a problem, whatever the issue, write a declaration. It can be one sentence long. But it's your declaration based on God's truth, not yours. So I will. The last two questions this morning on your worship, God. I will. I will renew my mind by aligning my thoughts with God's truth and my daily reading His Word and singing his praise. I will rewrite my perspective by declaring the victory, by writing it and repeating it daily. Remember this morning, there is no neutral. I want that to sink in. Say it with me this morning. There is no neutral. See, in a car you got neutral. And if you're on completely level ground, obviously you're not going to go anywhere. But if you have the slightest angle, there's going to be this gravitational pull, right? Everybody say gravitational pull. And that's your flesh. It's going to try to take you back down. So don't follow that pull of wrong thoughts. Don't follow that pull of negative thoughts. Don't, don't follow that pull, but keep moving forward. You're going to get stronger. Everybody say, I'm going to get stronger because there is no neutral. Not only do you need to move forward, but we need to move forward with the gospel. Our conversation needs to be about the motive or the furtherance of the gospel. My, my internal heart needs to be to magnify God, to glorify God, and I don't care what the circumstance is. And I'm going to pay for that statement, guarantee you that. 
Satan knows what I'm saying, and you know what? He likes to, to, to do his thing. And our circumstances are not going to be perfect, and we can't control them, but we can control how we let them help us or how we let them hinder us. So this morning, I'm encouraging you, don't leave without making a declaration today. Whether you pray that declaration at this front altar that's set aside, by the way, we're a living sacrifice. This altar needs to be a place where we don't feel uncomfortable. This needs to be a place where we feel comfortable. I just want to encourage you. Don't sit and do nothing. Put a pen in your hand and write a declaration about what God's telling you to do. Would you pray with me? As we begin our time of response, will you just simply slip out right now? Will you say, God, I know the declaration I need to write. I didn't get to write it yet, but I'm going to write it. Maybe you started it this morning, even in the message, and I actually wanted to stop for 10 minutes and let you start it, but I want you to write the declaration. What is it that God's telling you you need to write? Let's stop living in a place of needing to be rewired. Let's live in a place of renewal. Let's live in a place of rewriting our perspective. What new thought pathways does God need to create actually in this very moment? What topic or category of life is God telling you to rewire, to renew, to rewrite? Maybe you need to grab the, the hand of a husband or wife and say, listen, let's go renew our hearts this morning. It doesn't have to be something that is against the Holy Spirit to draw you to the altar. It can be because of your longing to magnify Him, to glorify Him. It's not always a negative to bend a knee. I want you to understand this morning that Paul begs the church, I beseech you, I beg you to be that living sacrifice. What is it today that you need to declare?